right, you got this on there, sound man? All right, good to see everybody tonight, and uh, hey, spring is past, summer is here, and uh, what was it, 84 degrees today? My, oh my, and uh, it's okay, it may be winter by the weekend, we'll just have to wait and see, so, uh, but good to have you in church tonight. All right, take your Bible tonight and go to John chapter 1, please. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 1. And uh, we'll continue our study on the disciples, and we'll talk about the very first disciple. His name was Andrew. <clears throat> we meet him in John chapter 1. Uh, I'm going to begin reading at verse 35, all right? Verse number 35 of John chapter 1. Again, the next day, after John stood, and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. And let's pray together. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here tonight. And Lord, as we open up your word and we study it together, we're asking for you to help us and for the Holy Spirit to teach us. I pray that you'll help us to be clear in the lessons we glean from this wonderful disciple called Andrew. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to be doers of the word and not just hearers only tonight. And so bless our study together. May we glean the truths that you would have us to glean from the life of this good man. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Andrew, he is the, we said last week about you could group the 12 disciples into three different groups of four. Uh, The first four, of course, Peter, James, John, and Andrew. And he's always the fourth one mentioned, but he's in the first group, okay? He's in that first four, but he's the least known of those four for sure. Uh, always in the background, and you'll see that as we unfold with his life a little bit here in the Scripture. But he was the first of the twelve to be called by Jesus and to begin to follow Jesus. He, uh, he and his brother Simon were from Bethsaida. Bethsaida, then they moved to Capernaum. They moved there for fishing reasons. It was a better place for their fishing business. They shared a home there. And they operated their commercial fishing business. They were, Peter and Andrew were probably lifelong friends of the other two brothers, James and John, and with whom they also were in business. You know, Andrew is always mentioned in a good light. He, he doesn't have any bad marks against him. Uh, anytime he did something, it was right. Anytime he said something, it was right. He never brought any dishonor to the name of Jesus Christ. His name means manly. He was bold. He was decisive. He was deliberate. He was a man's man. I I think originally he was a disciple of John the Baptist. Now I would think if you're a disciple of a guy who wears camel's hair and eats wild locusts, you better be a man, okay? And, uh, and he was. And so he's a follower of John, and when John said, here's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, then Andrew began to follow Jesus and, and walk after him. In fact, it's interesting. If you notice we were reading, when Jesus turned in verse 38 and saw them following, and it's Andrew and John that are following him, 
he said unto them, What seek ye? And of course they said, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? And he said, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelled and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. The tenth hour had been about four o'clock in the afternoon. There's twelve hours in the day, and there's twelve hours in the night. The night time is from 6 p.m. till 6 a.m. And there were, there were four watches of the night, from 6 to 9 p.m., from 9 to 12, from 12 to 3, and from 3 to 6 a.m. Twelve hours in the day, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So here it's the tenth hour, it's four o'clock in the afternoon, so they just stay and they talk to Jesus. Or more importantly, Jesus talks to them and they just listen. Uh, and, and by the way, remember we, we spoke last week about Jesus probably was almost halfway through the three years before he chose these twelve. So Jesus has been ministering, but he's been ministering by himself. Been teaching, been preaching, been, been, uh, he's had his time in the synagogue and such, but now he's teaching them. And what a time that must have been. I can imagine that private fellowship with Jesus was uh, left a big impression upon him. Well, we know it did, and we're going to see what happened after he left Jesus. But uh, there's several things we're going to learn from Andrew tonight, all right? Uh, lessons we learned from Andrew. Number one, we learned the value of bringing others to Jesus. The value of bringing others to Jesus. Well, he spent time with Jesus. We know that he stayed there and listened to Jesus. And uh, that says, verse 40, that it was Andrew, Simon's Peter brother. And notice verse 41. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And then he brought him to Jesus. The value of bringing others to Christ. Boy, he heard, he heard John talk about Jesus. John was the one who said, there's one coming after me, the latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. He said, there's coming, I baptize you with water, there's coming one after me that's going to baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost. He always was pointing them to Jesus. So as no, don't, don't think John felt bad when Jesus came on the scene and his disciples left him to follow Jesus. That's what he was preparing them for. He was, he was, we wanted them to do that. He said, he, Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. So he wanted them to follow Jesus. And here, they begin to follow him. Not only did to follow him, he gets to sit and listen to Jesus. Uh, they, 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 apparently, they spent the night there, wherever Jesus was staying, and he talks to them into the evening. And then the next day, the first thing he does, he's going to find his brother. I want you to notice his persistence. You know, once he heard about Jesus and he knew who Jesus was and he listened to Jesus, it was such good news to him, he couldn't keep it to himself. He couldn't, he was excited about it. And so he sets out with persistence to find the person he loves the most, his own brother, and brings him to Jesus Christ. One of the surest signs that you know Christ is your Savior is you are burdened about people you love that they know Him too. That you're concerned about loved ones and people who you care about, that they, if they're lost and they don't know Christ as their Savior, you want them to know Jesus too. Because you're excited about being saved. You're excited to know your sins are forgiven. You're excited to know you're on your way to heaven. And man, I think everybody ought to know that. And we ought to be excited to share that with other people. And so he findeth his brother. That word findeth means... He had to do some looking. It means it wasn't easy. It means it wasn't convenient. He had to look to find... He didn't stop looking till he found him. It reminds me of the shepherd with the lost sheep, remember? He come back at 100 and he counted 99 and he realized one was still out there. And remember, he went out to find him. And he searched for him until he found him. He wasn't going to stop until he found him. And that's the way it was with Andrew. And when it says he brought him to Jesus, that word brought means to lead by laying a hold of. Lead by laying a hold of. He got a hold of Peter and he said, we're going to see Jesus. <laughs> and it indicates that there might have been some reluctance on Peter's part. Imagine that. Huh? Peter, Peter having his own, way, own, own thoughts about something. What do you think of that? But here's a great thing. Andrew wasn't taking no for an answer. 
he was going to be persistent. He said, no, you're going to come and see Jesus. Here's the Messiah. They had, they had had some discussion, obviously, about the Old Testament, and they talked about the Messiah. I think both of them had been followers of John. And so they were, he said, here he is. I, I, I found him, and, and, and I, I, you're nev- listen, you'll never bring other people to Christ unless you're persistent about it. Okay? You can't give up. Never give up. Don't give up on anybody. Just keep praying. Keep witnessing. Keep going after Him. Persistence. Persistence. Then, secondly, I see His speaking. His speaking. Notice what He said. We have found the Messiah. He was excited. He was was thrilled. He was passionate about it. Man, you you know how excited people get when they discover gold? Or when they discover oil on their property? And, and, and how excited they are. Uh, but those discoveries, they pale in comparison to those who find salvation in Jesus Christ. Hey, my sins are forgiven. Hey, I'm going to heaven when I die. Hey, the worst I'm ever going to have, it's right now. And I got it pretty good. So do you. Because we have eternal life. Nothing Nothing's more important than knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior and knowing you have eternal life. Everything pales in comparison to that. The Bible puts it this way. What should a man give in exchange for his soul? What good does it do? Hey, get all the money you want, get all the goods you want, get all the fame you want. If you die and spend eternity in hell, what does that all matter? It was all for nothing. Well, I want to know I have eternal life. That's the greatest gift you'll ever receive. That's the greatest discovery you'll ever discover. He met Christ and he couldn't get over it. He met Christ and he he had to talk about it. Man, I don't know about you, but that's the kind of salvation we need, brother. We don't get over it. We don't, don't, can't help but talk about it. And then he spoke... Only of Christ. He's telling them we found the Messiah. We found the one. We found the Christ. We found the anointed one of God. And, and somehow, Andrew just figured, Jesus, Jesus would want to meet anybody that wants to meet Him. And Jesus does want to meet anyone that wants to meet Him. He's able to save all those that come unto God by Him. And that, that reminds me, Let's speak of Jesus when we witness. We're going out, I had a text this week, someone was asking me, what's the difference between witnessing and soul winning? Witnessing is, is when you'll say something about the Lord or you'll give somebody a gospel track. You'll, you'll say something when you, when the difference with soul winning is you're not only witnessing, but you're inviting them to accept Christ as their Savior. You want to, they call that drawing the net. If you're fishing for men, you have to draw the net. You're bringing them to a decision. Will you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes or no? See? And you're winning them, not to yourself, but to Jesus Christ. And faith in Jesus Christ. And you do that by keeping the focus on Jesus Christ. Sometimes when you're witnessing and you want to tell somebody about Jesus, they'll, they'll begin to ask you about well, where did, where did Cain get his wife? And, you know, where did this and this happen and that happen? They come up with all kinds of things. And, and all it does, you don't, don't chase rabbits. Okay? Don't get off. I've had people say, um, you're, you're, I witnessed them, and they say, you're, you're Baptist. I say, yeah, I'm Baptist. They said, are you a dancing Baptist? Well, no, if I danced as a Baptist. So I did a two-step form. No, I didn't. I said, uh, Man, what are you talking? I said, listen, I, I'll be glad to talk to you about that after I'm done sharing with you what I'm about to share with you. And guess what? After I got through sharing about Jesus Christ and the gospel, she didn't care what kind of Baptist I was. She didn't care about any kind of dancing Baptist. And by the way, they won't care where King got his wife either. Right? It was just things that, that, God, that, that the Satan brings up in their head to try to get them off the, the subject. We're preaching Jesus Christ. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. 
What do we do when we witness? We lift up Jesus. He's the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. So we lift up Christ. His speaking. We found the Messiah. It's not a good life that saves. It's not the church that saves. Jesus Christ is the Savior. And so we preach Christ. And that's what we go to tell. And so we speak of Jesus when we witness. There's another time here when, in fact, what, what you'll find is every time that Andrew is mentioned in the New Testament, he is bringing someone to Jesus. Here, it's his brother. And he got him to Jesus. In John 12, the Greeks come to the feast. Let, let's look there. You're in John 1. Just turn over a few chapters to John chapter 12. Will you look there with me? John 12 and verse number 20. Notice it says, And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth who? Andrew. And again, Andrew and Philip tell who? Jesus. So here's some Greeks, they come to the feast, and they say, we want to see Jesus. Philip doesn't take him right to Jesus. Who's Philip take him to? Andrew. And then Andrew says, come on, Philip, I'll take him to Jesus. And he brings him to Jesus. So we see Andrew, he comes and he brings his brother to Jesus. We see Andrew and he's bringing the Greeks to Jesus. You'll find out the third place, and we're going to look at this in the next, next point, is uh, at the feeding of the 5,000, that little boy with his lunch. Guess who found him and brought him to Jesus? Good guess. It was Andrew. That's right. And uh, it was Andrew. Three times, he's mentioned, three times, he's bringing somebody to Jesus. All right? Always bringing... Dover. Listen, the, there's value in bringing someone else to Jesus Christ. Now, who's, who's, who's more famous? Andrew or Peter? Peter. Peter takes up... Peter got to write uh, first, second Peter. He got, to, he got, a lot of, got a lot of ink in the Bible. More so than what Andrew got. But you never know who you're going to lead to Christ. Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher in Boston and got burdened about winning his boys in his class to Christ. And one of the ones he went and led to Christ in a shoe store was a young man named Dwight Moody. And most of you have heard of D.L. Moody, who, who they say may have had two million converts. And, and here and in Europe, and was greatly used of God. But Ed Kimball just was a faithful soul winner and wanted to make sure that he brought D.L. Moody to Christ. And so Peter was very influential and a, very, and a great leader in the early church. But if Andrew hadn't been burdened for him, if Andrew hadn't have brought him to Jesus, it would have been somebody else we'd be reading about. It wouldn't be Peter. So never underestimate the value of bringing one person to Jesus Christ. Okay? Number two, Andrew teaches us the value of insignificant gifts. For here, I want you to go to John chapter 6 with me, please. John chapter 6. This is a familiar story about the feeding of the 5,000. The miracle that Jesus did in feeding the 5,000. The Bible says after these things... Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee and the Sea of Tiberias, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. And when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. Ah, oh, but one of his disciples, who is it? Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There's a lad here, which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about five thousand. 
And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remained, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. And those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Now notice, first of all, Andrew noticed the lad. Here's this multitude at least 5,000 men doesn't mention women and children, but obviously children was there. This boy was there. And Andrew notices him. He notices the lad. You know, little things often reveal the character of a person. To observe a little boy in a crowd like that says quite a bit about Andrew and is really pretty impressive. How observant are you to people around you? We'll talk about in our Sunday school lesson Sunday, the man who laid 38 years at the pool of Bethesda. It was by the sheep gate. The sheep gate is where they would bring the lambs for the sacrifice. It was a feast time. Thousands of people are there. But nobody notices the ones who are laying there hurting. We get busy with our sacrifices, get busy with our service, get busy with what we have to do, and we don't take time to notice who's got a broken heart, who's carrying a burden, who's weeping. Who's, uh, would you notice people? Would you, would you take time to be observant? He noticed the lad with all, this, all these people that are here. Secondly, he notified the Lord. In Mark, it's recorded that Jesus asked, how many loaves do you have, or how many loaves have ye? I'm sure it wasn't easy to report this. When there's 5,000 people there and you've got a guy's sack lunch, it's not real easy to go to Jesus and say, hey, look what I got. <laughs> I don't think you say that. You say, well, here it is. And that's why he said, what's this? You know, I mean, this isn't much, I know. And uh, it wasn't easy to report that, but Andrew admits what they have. Listen, God, God may ask you what you have, not to embarrass you and not to embarrass me, but in order for us to see our smallness and that He can use our small things and make something great happen with them. Most of us, most of us face it. Most of us, we don't have anything to offer God. We're saying, God, take our five loaves and our two fishes and do something with it. And he does. And he can and he will. And so he's teaching Andrew and all the disciples a lesson that no gift is insignificant when it's placed in the hand of God. No gift is insignificant when it's put in the hand of God. That widow woman who threw in her two mites into the treasury they were watching, and remember the rich ones were putting in out of their abundance. They were putting in some big bills. And the widow woman just put in two mites. And Jesus said, she's put in more than all of them. You know why? Because she didn't have anything left. Oh, now, he's not, By the way, he, he's not condemning the ones who put in out of their abundance. He's just saying, I know what they had left over after they gave that. And this woman had nothing left over. It's, the, it's in, in a small scale. It's, it's like when the offering's passed, you open your wallet up, and there's a $1 bill and there's a $10 bill. And the battle begins. Do I put the 10 in? Do I put the 1 in? Do I put the 10 in? Do I put the 1 in? Uh, I got to eat. I, I want to get this. How do I? How am I going to do that if I put the 10 in? I only got one. One doesn't get me anything anymore. And boy, back and forth you go. Don't look at me that way. You, you do that. Everybody looking real pious at me. <laughs> Wish you could see all the faces looking this way, you know. It's the sacrifice and faithfulness of the giver, not the size of the gift that is the true measure of its significance. Did you get that? It's the sacrifice and faithfulness of the giver 
not the size of the gift that is a true measure of its significance. It's, it's not the greatness of the gift. It's the greatness of the God to whom the gift is given. No gift is insignificant in the hand of God. Many years ago, a young boy attended a special evangelistic service in Scotland. And in that service, he accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. At the end of that meeting, there were some that were disappointed in the meeting. The result of the, because this little boy was the only result from that special meeting. The money they'd invested, the effort they had put forth, and all they had to show was this little boy that accepted Christ as his Savior. But what they didn't know was that little boy would grow up and he would open up Africa to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That little boy was David Livingston. You don't, you don't, don't, don't think, well, we just had one saved. Well, you don't know what that one could do. You don't know what God's going to do with that one. And so never, uh, never underestimate the value, the value of an insignificant gift and whatever you have, little as much when God is in it. Just make sure what you have is offered to Him for God to use. Okay? Number three, we learn from Andrew the value of inconspicuous service. Inconspicuous service. Did you catch several times when reading about Andrew? Right after his name, you hear this phrase, Simon Peter's brother. You think you ever got tired of hearing that? Anybody here have an older brother or older sister? And every time, did you ever, when you went to school, Brother Dave, you go through that in Louisville, uh, you go to school, oh, you're Jay Yoder's brother. Right? I heard that. Oh, you're, my brother was a, was a tremendous basketball player, even though he was only five foot ten. He played varsity basketball as a freshman. He, I, I think he still holds the Ohio record for eighth graders. He scored 66 points in a game all by himself. And uh, he's, uh, he was a great player. So as I came up, oh, you're Scott Slayball's brother. Yep, that's me. See? Uh, just kind of goes with that. And anytime you saw Andrew, oh, yeah, Peter's brother. Yeah. But it never seemed to bother Andrew. He never seemed to get upset about that. You know, some people will not play in the band unless they get to beat the drum. Someone said, the hardest instrument to play in the orchestra is second fiddle. Nobody wants to play second fiddle. Andrew epitomizes Ephesians 6 and verse 6. Ephesians 6 and verse 6 says this, Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. That's all Andrew did. Andrew said, I'm going to serve God, and uh, it doesn't matter if they recognize me or don't recognize me. It doesn't matter if I just always in Peter's shadow or not. It doesn't bother me. I'm just going to serve God from my heart. And he did. He willingly took second place. He was mo more concerned about getting people to Jesus than he was about who got credit for doing it. He was a leader with a servant's heart. Andrew never sought to be the center of attention. That wasn't important. But more importantly, listen, not only did he never seek to be the, the, the center of attention, he never resented those who were. He, he, he wasn't, didn't get the attention that Peter, James, and John got. When, when Christ in, went up on the mountain of transfiguration, who did he take with him? Peter, James, and John. What do you think Andrew said? Andrew said, yeah, what am I, nothing? What am I, chop liver? Andrew never said that. Andrew said, hey, praise the Lord, they get to go. He didn't have any problem with those being in the spotlight. They got to see Jesus transfigured. He didn't. He just kept serving faithfully. He did what he could with what God gave him. 
He did what he could with what God gave him. A great, great servant of Jesus Christ. He never preached to the multitudes. He never started a church. He never wrote an epistle. He's not mentioned in Acts or the epistles. But he was a faithful servant of Jesus Christ. History says he went north ended up in Achaia, which is near Athens in Greece. That's where he was crucified. It is said he he led the wife of one of the provincial governors, governor of one of the provinces there, he led his wife to Christ. And it infuriated the, the governor. And he went to his wife and he demanded that she recant her faith in Jesus Christ. And she wouldn't do it. And so he commanded that Andrew be crucified. It was an X-shaped cross. And rather than nail him to that cross, they strapped him to the cross to make it his suffering last longer. And as historians record it, they say Andrew spent three days on that cross telling everybody who passed by and who would listen about Jesus Christ and to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Continuing to exhort people to be saved. Thank God for people like Andrew. What a disciple. Quiet, laboring faithfully, inconspicuously, laboring only to hear the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. The value of bringing others to Jesus. The value of insignificant gifts and the value of inconspicuous service. May God help us to be like Andrew. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, thank You for this evening. Thank You for our study here of Andrew. Thank You, Lord, for the wonderful qualities that You gave to him. Thank You for his love for You for His desire to bring others to faith in You. Lord, I pray that what could be known of us would be that they were always trying to bring someone to Jesus. They gave to the Lord what they had. It may seem insignificant, but God did great things with it. And they were inconspicuous in their service. They didn't need to have the limelight. They didn't want the spotlight. Oh, they were glad when other people got it. But they just faithfully, humbly served their Lord. Help us to have these qualities of Andrew in our life. Our Lord, dismiss us with your care, and I pray that you'll make us mindful that you go with us as we leave this place. May we point others to Christ this week. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen.